Presenting RAMAC, Random Access Method of Accounting and Control. Another business service of tomorrow made possible today by IBM. Companies have long dreamed of an accounting system capable in a single operation of recording transactions as they occur. RAMAC is that dream come true, processing with amazing speed unrelated data, randomly presented and randomly transacted. In the 305 RAMAC, IBM has combined the power, speed, and flexibility of electronics required in the random access method of accounting and control. Here is a data processing machine that is beautifully designed, a machine whose compact integrated construction makes possible a multitude of operations. In addition to random or inline data processing, the 305 will serve us a flow of other information. This includes online printed documents and various types of punched card output. RAMAC also contains extensive facilities easily accessible for storing information. RAMAC requires a miracle memory. The 305 has it. Five million characters magnetically recorded on 50 disks revolving 1,200 times a minute. These 50 disks will hold as much information as 32 cartons containing 64,000 IBM cards. Input to RAMAC is by IBM unit record cards. Fed in at up to 125 per minute, each card is read, recorded, and checked. The magnetic process drum revolving 6,000 times per minute has recording tracks for stored program instructions, data storage, arithmetic functions, and inquiry data. Input and output tracks permit independence of input and output units. The magnetic core unit synchronizes the flow of data to and from each independent unit. These units, having different cycle rates, need a high-speed transfer storage device to avoid transmission delays. The magnetic core unit does the job. The address register pinpoints the location of information in disk storage. Each block of 100 characters has an address. The access arm, given any address, will locate the information with a random access average of six-tenths of a second. Data can be read or written from a stored program instruction or from a manual inquiry station. For the first time, IBM combines the stored program for data processing and the wired control panel for logic elements and control. All these components that we have just seen are housed within the trim gray process unit. Also compactly stored inside are miles of electronic circuiting, the very nerve network of the 305 RAMAC. To provide flexibility in data processing, the 305 is equipped with two output devices, an IBM unit record card punch and an online printing device capable of accepting information directly from RAMAC in readable form. This is made possible by a single type head engraved with alphanumeric characters. The magnetic structure of the characters on the output track selects and prints the type head. The device can turn out 80 lines per minute of 20 characters under wired format control. This is the operating control station of the 305 RAMAC. Here is displayed the instruction word that is being executed and the program step being performed. Operating signals and controls include program selector, program start, and program stop. Logic functions displayed are accumulator, selector, and compare status. Another important console feature is the ability to read current conditions in response to a manual inquiry. The inquiry station consists of an alphanumeric keyboard and an automatic electric typewriter. The operator must key the address of the desired 100 character record. Completion of the inquiry and presentation of the record to the automatic typewriter can be completed in less than one second. The typed inquiry response is again under wired format control. A forceful reminder of the 305's processing ability is the rapid display of instruction execution, faster even than the eye can follow. In modern business, where time is money, the 305 RAMAC has made bookkeeping a matter of split seconds.
You're watching Sleepcore. Pleasant dreams. Protection comes high. Sky high. Today, we must be on guard in the sky when it comes to protecting our resources. The national resources that are so precious to us. The offensive weapons of tomorrow are here today. Supersonic. Super destructive. Seemingly unresistible. To protect the future of America, the defense techniques of tomorrow had to be discovered now. They were discovered in electronics. That is how SAGE and bursting computers into military service. Electronics for combat use means new concepts, new tools, new weapons. You are listening to the heartbeat of the SAGE computer. Every instrument in this room is constantly monitoring, testing, pulse taking, controlling. For this is the programming and operation center for the SAGE computer which surrounds it. To it come continuous streams of data which it continuously absorbs and stores on magnetic drums, tapes, and cores. Data from radar units, Texas towers, picket ships, early warning aircraft, ground observer corps, weather bureau. To say nothing of up-to-the-minute data on all regularly scheduled commercial air flights. It also packs away information as to the number, location, and characteristics of all military craft, all anti-aircraft guns, all defensive missiles in the area. And this computer is on the job around the clock with 24-hour-a-day reliability. It is really two computers but only one is operating the system. The other, with the same vast memory, performs as a slave, checking calculations and results, ready to take over in a matter of seconds should the master computer falter. All this is housed in one of the new headquarters of computer defense, one of the direction centers of what the Air Force calls SAGE. Beyond a fantastic capacity for calculation and memory, SAGE possesses the newest, and most revolutionary advance in data processing, the display scope, a computer-generated visual display on call as needed. Until SAGE, the miracle of the computer was its ability to calculate in split seconds and then provide printed information. But SAGE needed more than this. For the lightning shifts of air battle the Air Force requested from IBM, a computer capable of translating volumes of changing data into a continuous flow of interpretations which could be understood at a glance. Air defense required split-second presentation as well as split-second calculation. Given this objective, IBM applied the latest extension of data processing, the display scope, a giant picture tube on which computer results are instantaneously and continuously translated into graphic images. In SAGE, airmen have the battle visualized for them on the computer-generated display. Two floors above the great computers 
are the batteries of displacecopes. Although they look like the offspring of a marriage between a television tube and a radar screen, displacecopes do not show physical images transmitted from elsewhere. They display the results of the computer's findings. Sage, with its displacecope, also has one feature possessed by neither a television or radar screen. It has memory. In case of enemy air attack, not only can a clear picture of the changing air situation be displayed on the scope, but if the airman wishes to see how things got that way, the scope can recall any previous phase of the situation from the computer's memory. By analyzing the past, SAGE can project into the future. The computer can furnish information on the countermeasures available so that the officer in charge can make his choice as to when and where to fight. Once he has selected a plan of counterattack, the computer guides interceptors and missiles to the enemy. After encounter, the computer guides the interceptors back to their bases. Aladdin's lamp couldn't do more. What is the most precious commodity that electronics defense wins us? Time. Long before the bomber reaches our defense perimeter, the computer's memory will identify it as friendly. But if a flight of planes were identified as hostile, then, in a matter of minutes, time is everything. This is electronic defense in depth. And what better reason for an effective air defense? But is this protection enough? Here is protection too. The protection which comes with the possession of weapons of retaliation. Just as our defensive powers had been advancing, so have our instruments of attack. The demands of plane warfare require the fantastic ability of modern computers. The question was, how could the electronic computer be made airborne? Problems of consequence when designing a computer for ground installation became overwhelming when it was proposed to redesign them to fit into jet bombers. First, the problem of space and weight. The interior of a modern bomber is cramped for space as is. How can a bulky computer be fitted into it? For every extra pound of dead weight carried, a bomber must add many more gallons of fuel. Second, the problem of reliability. Could a computer be designed to withstand all the stresses of flight? Weather, climate, turbulence. Third, maintenance. Could a computer be designed for easy ground and air maintenance? These and other problems were all finally solved by unique design and by employing the basic principle of modular construction. The same multiple arrangement principle which was applied in the design of this doll furniture enabled the Air Force to procure an airborne computer. By designing an electronic assembly packaged in self-contained units which are then joined, a computer of flexible construction was achieved. It can either be installed in a compact unit or parts can be distributed according to the space available. Self-contained units make it easier to achieve durable construction and easier to test each unit for reliability. Under all conditions, an airborne computer is likely to be exposed to and some highly unlikely ones. High altitudes up to 120,000 feet. Low temperatures down to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Below zero. High temperatures up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit sunlight. And rain tests. Life tests of mechanical and electronic units. Vibration tests. In this test, the question is not will the computer work under this condition, but how long will it work? 
Once the continued capabilities of the airborne computer were established, there was only one other major obstacle, field maintenance. To solve this problem, IBM drew on its commercial experience. It converted its control panels to military use. In order to test a unit of an airborne computer, the technician merely selects the proper control panel. He then plugs the units into the test equipment and the signal lights tell him whether the units are working or not. This puts testing computer units in the same class as testing light bulbs. Today, the airborne computer is no longer a theory nor an experiment. It's a fact, tested, functioning, practical, and restricted. It has gone into production under the label Brain, bombing, radar, navigation equipment. A new plant is being rushed to completion in Owego, New York, to boost its output. Here is a scale model of a B-52 showing the relative locations of brain equipment. The rest of the system, computers, periscope, and screen, are designed to take up a minimum of space and to give a maximum of use. Computers have taken wing. Hey, Phil, I got some crosshair jitter in both azimuth and elevation. Would you pull the AR-5 and replace it with a spare? Sure, Don. Give me a minute. It'll only be a second more. Yeah, I think I got it now. OK, the amplifier's replaced. How's the jitter? Settle down. Yeah, it's OK now. Thanks, Phil. And as long as we're on guard, as long as we're ready to look ahead and move ahead, the future of America is secure. Watching Sleepcore, Media for Insomnia. westward through the wilderness, scanning the distant horizon. The sailor, perched aloft in his crow's nest, constantly alert to the dangers of the sea that lie ahead. So man moved forward through the ages, reaching out toward new goals, ever probing ever seeking, ever searching. I paid two dollars for that golf ball. With the coming of the scientific era, man's ability to increase his range of vision grew by leaps and bounds. Every day brought new inventions, new devices, all helping him to see better and farther than ever before. I'll find it if it takes all night. In the field of aviation, perhaps more than any other, the need to probe what lies ahead is most pronounced. Pilots in the early days had to depend solely on their own eyesight to bring them safely to their destinations. But as instruments were developed, their range of vision was steadily increased. 
the gyro compass operating independently of the earth's magnetic field two way radio supplying direct contact between air and ground the artificial gyro horizon telling the pilot when his plane is horizontal under blind flying conditions voice radio communication automatic direction finding equipment enabling a plane to home to any audible signal high frequency navigational systems and now at last comes the newest and greatest addition to this impressive list radar radar why yes well that's a new one on me i thought radar was strictly military stuff you know for bombers and battleships it was originally but now pan american is installing radar in its passenger planes no kidding i bet it's pretty complicated stuff huh not really you see, the whole thing is based on the echo principle. Echo? Yes. Suppose you were on a mountaintop and... Well, wait, I have a better idea. Let's put you on a mountaintop. Now, would you mind shouting something? Okay. Four! Good. Now, let's see what happened. The sound waves of your voice traveled out in all directions. Part of these sound waves hit the mountain and were reflected back, just as light waves are reflected by a mirror. Now, suppose we wanted to measure this distance. We know that sound waves travel at about 1,000 feet per second. So, let's ring a bell and count the seconds until the echo returns. Six seconds which means that the sound waves traveled a total of 6,000 feet out and back. Well, the principle of radar is exactly the same, but instead of using sound waves, we use radio waves, high frequency ones called microwaves. Knowing their speed, we can measure distances just as we did with your echo. Well, do radio waves go fast? Very fast. They travel at 162,000 nautical miles per second. In other words, in the space of a single second, a radio wave could go seven times around the world. That's traveling. This radar stuff must take plenty of fancy equipment. You bet it does. Airline radar sets consist of five very intricate parts. The transmitter receiver, the antenna, the synchronizer, the plan position indicator, or scope, and of course, the control panel. The antenna, located in the nose of our plane, is covered by a fiberglass shell called the radome. This shell is transparent to our radar beam. The scope contains a tube like that used in television sets and acts as a screen on which we see our radar picture. Standard installation provides two scopes, one for the pilot and one for the co-pilot. Okay, so how does it work? Well, let's look at our parts in diagram form. The synchronizer generates timing impulses called trigger pulses at the rate of 400 a second. These are sent to the transmitter and the scope, both at the same moment. The transmitter, in turn, sends a short pulse of radio energy to the antenna. This pulse travels from the antenna along a narrow beam. At microwave speed, the round trip to an object 150 miles away takes less than one five hundredth of a single second. Now let's get back to our scope. The scope translates this pulse into electrons, which cause a small luminous spot to appear. Each new pulse is deflected, so that a steady flow of them keeps moving to the edge of our screen. Actually, they move so fast that they create the impression of a single, almost invisible line, which is called the sweep. Now, let's look at our radar antenna. See that reflector? It's a giant addition of those found in flashlights, and it's used for the same purpose, to concentrate our beam. This makes the beam pretty narrow, so in order to get the greatest coverage, our antenna turns slowly in a 360-degree circle. The sweep on our picture is coordinated with this, so that both beams move together. What's that dark wedge at the bottom? That's the shadow cast by our airplane itself. Well, what happens when the beam picks something up? 
When something appears in our beam, the microwaves are reflected back to the antenna, then to the receiver, and finally to our scope. The radar beam and the sweep are so matched that an object picked up by the beam appears in an exact relative position on the scope. Remember that our sweep line is continually revolving in time with the beam. As it passes over the face of the scope, it literally paints a picture for the pilot to study. Our sweep is set so that the aircraft heading is always at the top of the screen. Now, we add a grid for bearings and some rain circles to help in measuring distances, and our story is complete. Well, gee, this is all pretty interesting, but what's the point? I mean, uh, how much good does it do the pilot of the passenger plane? Does radar really help him much? It helps everybody. By giving the pilot eyes that can pierce fog, haze, smoke, and clouds, radar helps him get you to your destination quickly and safely, with greater efficiency, greater saving of time, greater passenger comfort. It helps the pilot to know his terrain, thereby lessening his fatigue and that of his crew. It helps warn him of approaching storms so that he can steer clear of them and give you a smoother, more enjoyable ride or find a pathway through them, saving detours that might cause loss of time. Uh, what was that you said before about helping the pilot to know his terrain? Well, terrain mapping is one of the main functions of airline radar. It's possible to tilt the radar beam up and down which helps to give the pilot a clear idea of the ground ahead of him, regardless of the visibility conditions through which he's flying. Let's look at some actual radar pictures made during a Pan American Airways flight to Panama. We're approaching San Blas Point, flying over a solid layer of clouds. Direct vision isn't much help, but the first sign of land appeared on our radar scope about 100 miles out. Here we see San Blas on the 50-mile range setting. 24 miles out, and San Blas Point is clearly visible. Two minutes later, we switch to a shorter range for a more accurate distance check. San Blas Point is now 16 miles ahead, and we're right on course. Hey, uh, the water showed up black and the land white. How come? There's a very simple reason. Smooth surfaces, like bodies of water, cause our beam to bounce off, to be deflected, so it fails to return to the antenna, and those areas appear dark on our screen. Land surfaces, though, have irregularities, some small, some large, but usually enough to reflect the beam back to its source. As a result, these pulses register on our scope, and land masses show up bright. When approaching a mountain, our radar beam will bounce back from the near side, showing brightly on our screen. The far side of the mountain, which can't be reached by the beam, remains in shadow. So a radar echo of a mountain peak would look like this. Now let's take a look at the most important use of radar, its ability to map weather conditions. Our pilots try constantly to give you the smoothest and most comfortable ride they can. But a lot depends on the weather. Now, thanks to radar, the pilots can see storms long before they reach them and avoid them wherever possible. This means more comfort for our passengers and a smoother ride than ever before. What do you mean, see storms? I thought you said radar cut right through clouds. Through ordinary cloud cover, yes. But areas with heavy rainfall, cold fronts, thunderstorms, these show up very clearly on the radar scope. Like this, and this, and this. Even hurricanes show up on our screen. Here's a recent one off Cedar Keys. Hmm, I'd sure like to steer clear of that. So do we, and radar makes it easy. Now let's look at one more device called Contour. This helps the pilot probe the center of a thunderstorm as well as its outer edges. Contour reverses the brightness of the echo so that the worst part of a storm shows up as a dark mass inside it, like this and this. Result, the pilot can not only see storms miles away, but he can see into them. 
Gee, I get what you mean now uh, about radar being helpful. Let's listen to some actual comments by Pan American pilots taken from their reports. Invaluable. Use of this equipment provides extra reassurance to the crew. Lessens the possibility of fatigue. Radar helped us avoid several storm areas. Stewardess served all meals right on schedule. No difficulties whatsoever. I believe radar is almost indispensable on the Lisbon-Joburg route. Makes for tremendous saving in time and a more comfortable flight. Terrific help in making a landfall approaching Gander westbound. Radar is wonderful. Our flight was conducted with slight detours. Passengers enjoyed normal flying conditions and service, whereas other flights in the area were getting plenty of turbulence. Say, uh, you think maybe I can see radar in action? Sure thing. Climb aboard. Pan American is always happy to have its passengers visit the cockpit, under supervision, of course. Uh-oh. Fog. I can't see a thing. No, not with a naked eye. But let's take a look at the radar. Hey, we're over the golf course. I will head out to sea. If you watch, you'll catch the coastline. Yeah, there it is. Clear as a bell. Just like a map. Now, let's raise our beam and see what the weather's like up ahead. Hmm, there's one of those thunderstorms. That's right. According to our range markings, it's about 30 miles away. We can move slightly to the south and avoid it easily. Hey, this is really something. Never thought I'd be playing tag with the weather. Uh-oh, what's that we're coming to? Hmm. Solid squall line, stretching for miles. Things are going to get bumpy. Uh, we'll have to go around it, huh? Uh, make a detour? Nope. Take a look at what our radar shows. The storm appears to be solid, but you can see that there are actually only three heavy echoes. That leaves plenty of clear space in between for us to fly through. Well, that was pretty simple, wasn't it? Saved us a lot of time, too. And not a single bump. From now on, it's going to be more fun to fly than ever. Now, let's head back to your golf course. Uh, you enjoy your trip? I sure did. I learned things, too. It really is a... My golf ball! <laughs> Wait a minute. Radar isn't quite that good. At least, not yet. You're watching Sleepcore. Sleep tight. Despite the large numbers of clerks employed today, sufficient clerks are still hard to find. With full employment, the security of clerical work does not offer the old attraction. But trade is becoming more competitive, so clerks are in even greater demand to provide statistics from a mass of data so that management can grasp the changing factors and act accordingly. To fulfill this modern need came the first automatic office in the world. Electronic computers are not new, but Leo was the first designed for office work. Since 1953, it has been employed regularly on accounting, stock and cost control, statistics, and of course, payroll. LEO is fast and flexible. It can test the feasibility of the information that is fed into it and check the accuracy of its own results following orthodox accounting principles. LEO can be installed anywhere. It does not require any having its own ventilation system. It is supplied complete with equipment for stabilizing the mains voltage. Leo Mark II has four channels for input of information and four more for output. This particular installation is using three input channels, two coupled to punch card readers and one to a punched tape reader. Its output can be routed to card punches for machine reading or any of the normal printing devices. Any other suitable form of input or output can be coupled. Leo is set in operation though. It is here that its performance can be monitored. At the factory of Leo Computers Limited, new requirements are investigated by programmers, method men, and electronic engineers. And at the right time, they are crystallized into a development plan. In the laboratories, the development plan is transformed into a logical scheme involving hundreds of electronic circuits. Having been working on automatic offices since 1949, this development team know what is wanted for regular, routine operation in commercial and industrial offices. 
Once the outline of a new scheme has been established, it is handed over to the designers. Their task is to work up the details into drawings and circuit diagrams. Built into the electronic design is the know-how that comes from practical experience of automatic offices. When designs are checked, tracers make final drawings. The mounting of the electronic components require a great deal of purely mechanical design. To ensure that all parts are interchangeable, each must fall within definite engineering limits precisely determined in advance by the designer. This is ensured by making jigs. Using the jig, hundreds of parts may then be produced within the design limits. The assembled racks are wired for interconnections between you. Manufacture of the electronic circuits begins with small packages carrying a few valves assembled by hand. Every soldered connection is inspected for good workmanship and freedom from dry joints. The packages are then incorporated into larger units. The larger units are electrically checked connection by connection against the designer's drawings. Thus, each part has been checked mechanically and electrically before it goes over to a new Leo. At the new Leo, individual assemblies are set together for functional electrical tests to prove that the performance of each circuit conforms to specification under normal and marginal conditions. An electronic computer for office work must be absolutely reliable because delays are intolerable in an office working to a deadline, hence the checking and inspection at all stages. Leo has been designed primarily for this work, but is perfectly capable of mathematical work. And between office jobs, night or day, it does calculations for a wide variety of interests. For the Chancellor, Leo worked out the PAYE tables for 1955 to 56 and printed them off in one night. For the Institute and the Faculty of Actuaries, Leo calculated tables for life assurance and annuities. For the Ordnance Board, Leo worked out range tables. For Handley Page, Leo carried out flutter and stress calculations for faster, safer flight. For Atwood Statistics, Leo and the findings of market research. For the coal board, Leo worked out the classifications in the fight against pneumoconiosis. For the British Transport Commission, Leo worked out the shortest distance by rail from each station to all the other 4,000. This would have taken 50 clerks five years. For an hour a day, Leo belongs to its engineers for maintenance and testing. The voltage, normally kept to the operating figure, is made to fluctuate. Any valve or other component rate in such conditions is certainly fit for another 24 hours useful life. And if it cannot, then now is the chance to change it. Special programs designed to be much more exacting than normal work are run through to test all components and circuits up to their designed limits. Now the machine is ready for the day's work. Typical of the routine office problem is payroll. Every man at the Ford Motor Company, like anyone else, expects to be paid on time and paid correctly. Such numbers would have always been equal problem. But nowadays, clerks are scarce, and there's a lot more detail to be worked out. The rate differs from man to man, and so does the number of hours worked. Overtime rates vary. Each man is taxed differently. Some men are repaying loans by deductions. Most contribute to the sports fund, Quite a few allow deductions for national savings. On top of all this, any item is liable to change at short notice. Normal timekeeping staff deal with the clock cards daily. Other people collect alterations to code numbers, rates of pay, deductions and so on. The clock cards and alterations are then sent off to the Leo Automatic Office 20 miles away by the Ford Motor Company's regular courier service through London.
Once the information reaches the automatic office, it is put into a form Leo understands. In this case, punched paper tape. As a check, another girl produces a second tape from the same cards. The first tape is used as a control on the second girl's machine. This machine, besides punching the second tape, produces a printed tape marked in red at each place the checker has made a correction. In this way, Routineer can make sure that corrections have been done properly. When all is ready, Leo is given its operating instructions. Then each man's rate of pay and other personal data and the running records produced by Leo last week are fed in. Concurrently, new information for this week is fed in from the paper tape. Leo's speed is such that less than a second later, the actual payslips print out in duplicate. Payslip after payslip, produced at the rate of 5,000 an hour. Simultaneously, Leo is able to print for one man, whilst doing the calculations for the next man, and taking in the data for the man after that, dealing with three men at the same time. Whilst all this is going on, each man's running total card for next week is being punched. Immediately the last payslip is printed, Leo prints off reconciliation figures, cash dissection totals, and statistics. Back at Ford's pay office, the pay sheet is split into individual payslips. All that Leo has not done is to put the payslips into the envelopes together with the money and hand it to the man who earned it. National insurance information has been provided by Leo and also national savings. It has also prepared management statistics, printing such items as overtime hours and cost, bad timekeeping, average earnings by grades, and so on. Jay Lyons, besides payroll, require their Leo to do several other routine clerical jobs. A job done every afternoon concerns deliveries to their 150 tea shops in London. There are hundreds of items of food. Bakery goods of oats, kitchen goods in a wide variety, or the breakfast. All these, in a varying quantity each day, are delivered to a precise timetable to the tea shops. Understocking leads to lost sales, but with food, overstocking soon becomes intolerably wasteful. Each manageress has a standing order depending on the day of the week. After lunch each day, she considers her stock, weighs up local conditions, and decides what variations, up or down, she will make to her order. She speaks by telephone to head office, where her variations are taken directly onto cards. There is no written record. What the girl hears, she punches. At the same time, a short paper tape puts in last-minute management decisions, such as occur with changes in the weather. Thus is flexibility provided. Again, the program is fed first, laying down the sequence for the multiplicity of calculations Leo will perform. Next, the standing orders and the telephone revisions, tea shop by tea shop, are fed in, with the overriding variations on the paper tape. Immediately, packing notes begin to print ten shops at a time. At the same time, charges to tea shops and sales statistics are being recorded. After further electronic processing, these cards provide the statistics for the use of the management. By means of discriminants built into the program, Leo will examine all statistics, but only print the ones that require action. Managers are, in this way, given precise up-to-the-minute information, enabling decisions to be more closely related to trading conditions. Packing notes, which were printed by Leo 10 to a sheet, are separated. Yellow tinned, clipped to a packer's board, and sent to the dispatch. Subtotals of the different items have been worked out for bulk movement to the several loading bays. Although the last revision is earned until 3.30, by 4.30, Leo has printed for 150 tea shops and 40,000 items exactly what is wanted at each tea shop in the right order for the different loading bays. They are also in the right order for the carman's calls so that the goods at the front of the lorry can be delivered last and the first call is just inside the doors. 
these are only a few examples of the wide range of work undertaken by Leo. Building each automatic office is the result of skilled investigation and design. Each atom, similarly, calls for the experience and know-how of using automatic offices. Leo Computers Limited undertake all this in conjunction with the user's staff. Leo is a machine that does routine clinical work more quickly and more accurately than clerks. The clerks are freed for more rewarding and productive work as the use of Leo expands.